I'm very pleased that for tonight, Dr. Stephen Dorland of the University of Toronto has agreed to uh, uh, talk to us. Uh, uh, Stephen received his BA, MA, and PhD from the University of Toronto, and he did his PhD work under the supervision of Dave Smith, who some of us know uh, for sure, uh, on that. And his dissertation involved analyses of ceramics from late woodland sites, and he's been on a tear publishing the results uh, of that in a lot of the major journals that I've come across, like the Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory, the Journal of Archaeological Science Reports, and Ethnoarchaeology, and, and so on. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, it's really nice to have him here to talk about a paper he told me that he's revising and resubmitting uh, <laughs> earlier tonight uh, on that. So some of his work with ceramic assemblages from Huron-Wendat and earlier late woodland uh, sites. And his talk is entitled, Let's Start with Something Small, an evaluation of social learning and scaling practices in Great Lakes potting communities during the late woodland. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Stephen. So before we begin, I just want to do a land acknowledgement. And this land acknowledgement developed from that the OAS talk we did uh, with my other colleagues. And it kind of tweaks a little bit from the normal UTM in Toronto. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that the research presented today takes place on treaty territory of Mississaugas of the First Credit and traditional territory of Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and other Indigenous nations. As keepers of the land, each of these nations have shaped the history of this land for thousands of years through ways of doing, ways of knowing, and ceremony. And I want to show my respect and thank you. So, Tiawen, Niawen. Miigwech. Okay, so this paper investigates material traces of scaling practices and social learning through an examination of uh, decoration and pot sizes. So in this paper, I refer to Lozian Hall's interpretation of scaling, the process of adjusting the size of an object to make it easier for varying body sizes and abilities. So scaling is an effective method for beginners in a craft that accounts for psychomotor limitations by encouraging interaction with smaller versions of tools and other forms of material culture. So through this approach, beginners learn fundamental craft principles developed through their experiences in potting communities of practice, observing and engaging with skilled potters when necessary. In this paper, I investigate material traces of scaling practices used by potters in Great Lakes communities from circa late 13th to late 15th century. Um, I employ a decorative analysis of ceramics from seven Great Lakes assemblages through an evaluation of motif distribution of rim sherds and apply a micro stylistic analysis of decorative element widths. I focus primarily on four main size classes that are based on a neck diameter to vessel thickness ratio. So a very small, small, medium, and large. Very scientific names there. Through this approach, I identify key findings related to material traces of scaling practices. First, the results indicate that scaling practices involve motif execution and decorative technique and or tool use. So through a motif distribution analysis, I suggest small pots are mainly undecorated or decorated with motifs that require less design, execution, and less skill. Second, the results of uh, student T and ANOVA statistics, which I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but just the basis of it will be explained, um, indicate that very small pots are, have statistically equal means to, for their element widths. And this leads me to suggest with the motif distribution analysis that the makers of these two size groups, of the smallest two size groups were similar in ability and knowledge. So based on these findings, I suggest the makers of smaller pots were most likely learners, inexperienced potters who relied on a set of techniques or tools that acted as a foundation to become a skilled potter. So through scaling, learner potters gradually developed understanding of skilled practices through their own relations with materials, things, and potters, uh, learning craft basics required to become proficient and recognized as skilled by other members of potting communities. So in this paper, I focus my investigation of scaling practices and social learning on a case study in the Great Lakes. Before I begin, I provide a review of how social learning has been approached. Studies of learning and their links to broader questions of knowledge production are effective in the Great Lakes as a result of two key features. First, 
Ceramic collections in Ontario and upstate New York following the 11th century often comprise a substantial number of ceramic artifacts that embody less skill and experience, which are referred to as learner pots or a term similar to the concept of novice. And this is meant to replace the juvenile designation that embodies skill development related more to uh, experience rather than age-based assumptions related to performance. Second, the relatively short village inhabitation, lasting roughly 20 to 30 years, allows for a focus on two to three generations of learning, a very fine temporal resolution for archaeological study. So as an alternative to applications of cultural transmission theory, there have been some recent analysis of material traces associated with the identification of varying levels of skill and experience of broader and skillment experiences, uh, such as the work of, uh, of Daniel Ionico, um, Patricia Smith, Amanda Succo, and uh, Peter Timmons. So skill evaluations in the Great Lakes have drawn greatly from other methodologies in other cultural contexts that are based on identifying material traces on potsherds of fine motor skill and cognitive development. And there was a talk just uh, this week that Patricia Crown did uh, as part of LIRAC at McMaster. And she did an, an excellent talk talking about the, the, uh, childhood learning in the American Southwest. So one of the first skill evaluations related to pottery production developed in this American Southwest to assess skill related to decorational forming practices by pre-Hispanic potters. So grounded in educational psychology, Patricia Crown applied a micro stylistic study of painted strokes related to measuring cognitive abilities and fine motor skills. Two different socialization methods were identified to past Mimbres and Hohokam potting groups. Hohokam learners tended to emphasize motor skill development while Mimbres learners uh, involved recognition of broader design motifs. Now, in some cases, Crown further suggests children were given the opportunity to decorate near complete pots made by skilled potters. So Catherine Camp's analysis of forming methods suggests that learning strategies among Sinagua children involved the making of miniature figurines and small dishes to pr promote early skill development. And so as highlighted in Elizabeth Bagwell's study in the American Southwest, drawing and forming did not follow the same development progression, so they need to be studied separately. So drawing on these works, there have been attempts to move beyond the reliance of implicit assumptions and develop systematic methods of evaluating skill. And based on a study of seven Northern Iroquoian sites in Southern Ontario, dating between the late 13th century and 16th century, uh, Patricia Smith, looking at the Barry site, Wyachek, Carson, uh, Hubbard, Dunsmore, Dougal, and Molson, proposed for her master's thesis, her skill evaluation supported the belief that low-skilled, and in this case, she argued child potters, can be identified in ceramic collections. So rather than relying on assumptions that low-skilled pots were small, crudely made, and poorly decorated, Smith focused on decorative elements and the consistency of element impression depths, element lengths, element widths and element spacing, a form of decorative analysis, as well as an evaluation of thickness and curvature. So once she identified pots made by low-skilled potters, who she suggests were children, Smith proposed children influenced by grandmother generations acted as innovators who impacted broader decorative practices. And it's pretty amazing because that work was, it was a master's thesis and it turned into a paper for proceedings and it's the most widely cited article on childhood learning um, coming from Ontario. And it's, it's just amazing the story of trying, like Patricia Smith did this masters in the nineties that was ahead of its time and was following the same line as the theoretical development in England at Cambridge and Oxford, uh, but it, it didn't get the recognition and it wasn't recognized on a broader global scale. So building on Smith's work, my doctoral thesis proposed a method of skill evaluation that attempted to capture the broader pottery making process through material interactions. So through a ceramic study of mid late 15th century Northern Iroquoian sites. So Clock, Smith Padgery, Garoga, Keffer and Draper, I evaluated several variables. The relations between neck diameter and thickness ratio, which we'll be looking at in this paper, the relative frequency of fingerprints and fingernail impressions, 
the presence absence of tools related to thinning of pots and scraping, a psycho mortar evaluation based on element motif, and the relative frequency of castellations, and the relative frequency of decorative motifs. Um, and so here's just some examples. So some of the traits that I would look at would is, for example, looking at this the the straightness of the decorative motifs, the spacing of it, the overall thickness, identifying if there's tool marks on the inside of the vessel to indicate any kind of scraping or thinning, uh, looking at, at, at the proportions of it. And here's an example just to kind of show that, so this is from the New York State Museum. This is a Garoga in size, a larger vessel and a smaller vessel that even though they might not directly fall into these established types, the decorative motif, the design motif has a number of similarities. So for example, you have that line of obliques or well, obliques or fingernail impressions, whatever they are, uh, just as you have on this larger vessel, you have the horizontal line on the top. Uh, you don't have the notches at the bottom. And I think on this one, you do see some small notches on the top. So what it shows is there's a progression of learning there uh, that's linked to it, but there are some unique uh, nuances that we can identify and link that to skill. So the results suggested that learners in ancestral Wendat Mohawk, ancestral Wendat and Mohawk communities were practicing pottery through what I call flexible learning. So a form of learning practiced by several indigenous communities in North America, uh, including uh, the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and the Sasagas. And in this context, flexible learning is based on experience, experiences that promote creativity and flexibility, uh, which I demonstrate through attempts of forming and decorative traditions practiced by skilled potters, such as castellation and color forming and decoration using element motifs. And what was really interesting was the uh, castellation forms that Wendat pots uh, were projecting, but the castellation forming on learner pots at the Mohawk sites were not projecting. And at Mohawk sites, you don't have projecting castellations, whereas you do have that at Wendat sites. So that, that was a little interesting kind of demonstration that there are some nuances to the localized communities of practice, but it's not one essentialized, generalized uh, learning experience across the Great Lakes. Uh, So although flexible, although flexible, and this is important too, is learners and their artistic decisions were not completely free. Uh, they were contained within longstanding traditions practiced and recognized by potting communities. So we still see that banded decoration. If we really saw like truly saw something different, we would see these pictographs across the full pot. We would see different shapes. But what we see is that the, a gradual learning process of more skilled pots. So another method for evaluating skill lies in the identification of particular techniques or practices that may be related to beginner potters. So for example, through a petrographic analysis of learner pot sherds, uh, Sarah Stryker et al. evaluated learning practices related to temper and firing used at the mantle site um, in Southern Ontario. Uh, the results there uh, lead the, the paper to suggest that learners use small tester pots to develop basic knowledge of temper and firing practices. So in my doctoral thesis of learner artifacts, I identified the key differences among learner and skill pots that indicate difference in knowledge, such as the differences in tool use. So for example, there's rarely evidence of interior scraping, as I uh, just pointed out, which is clearly present on larger pots. And on larger pots, the scraping is uh, parallel to the collar, which indicates this kind of upward kind of circular motion rather than perpendicular, which wouldn't really make a lot of sense. Um, so there's little evidence of this. So little evidence for this technique indicates a lack of understanding of the importance of wall thickness consistency on learner vessels in relation to firing practices and daily use. So furthermore, in addition to learner pots usually being smaller, which is what seemed to be kind of the, the view, um, although Greg Braun has demonstrated that you, that's not the only quality, you have to look at other traits 
because you can you have skilled pot, spot potters making small little vessels. Uh, they often, so th the difference is these small learner pots have a, a low neck diameter wall thickness ratio, which indicates improper understanding of proportion. So they're often thicker and smaller rather than the larger pots, which have a, where are thinner walled and have larger ratios. And this is a variable we'll look at as well. Uh, so Owen Rye has emphasized the importance of appropriate proportions as a form of potting knowledge. So through the connection of variables related to particular potting habits, one can further investigate the extent of potting knowledge. In the following section, I propose inquiries into scaling practices as an avenue to explore social learning experiences. So past and contemporary societies recognize scaling practices as an important learning strategy that allows learners with physiological limitations to begin interactions with people, tools and materials within a community of practice. Now building on ethnographic accounts in the Canadian Arctic, Robert Park um, at Waterloo, uh, I believe, interpreted exceptionally small projectile points as child toys used to learn embodied knowledge and tools of hunting practices. So he noted that smaller tools were used, but also smaller prey were hunted to learn fundamental knowledge. So recently, uh, Losey and Hall suggest that smaller versions of atlatl weights and grips were used during the experiential process of enskillment uh, and demonstrate the use of equipment scaling used during learning experiences on the Pacific West Coast during the late Holocene. And the concept of equipment scaling that they've adopted uh, comes from sports literature and works on the basis that physiological constraints can limit abilities of individuals when learning a craft. And so to overcome these limitations, skilled community members develop tools that can be used by children learning atlatl techniques. So the creation of smaller version of hunting tools provides children in both case studies the opportunity to learn fundamentals related to material engagements prior to the development of appropriate strength gestures and knowledge. Uh, Matthew Wall's description of Netzelic hunters in the Canadian Arctic demonstrates the importance of understanding gestural positioning as a slight shift in the body can result in inaccurate shot and a missed target. So further as highlighted by Walls, continuous changing environmental conditions make no two shots the same. So a hunter must recognize how to adapt to these changes. So to understand these small subtleties related to proper techniques, children would need to control the bow and understand the mechanics of the bow and arrow. A child practicing on a larger bow with a greater draw weight will be unable to practice the basics, thus greatly reducing learning experience and understanding the materiality of the bow. As a child develops fundamentals related to body control, aim, and the ability to adapt to changing conditions, um, their body grows and they develop the appropriate strength technique, allowing them to use fully sized bows. So although there are different gestural motions required and different tool mechanics, in both cases, uh, scaled down versions of the tools used allow children to learn gestures required to develop a foundational understanding of the craft and become proficient. So as they learn the techniques, children acquire opportunities to learn and connect land-based knowledge associated with animal behavior, navigating through different landscapes while hunting and engaging in social relationships with other hunters. So the same principles of scaling discussed above can be applied to pottery making context. So scaling practices are evident in ethnographic cases in which beginner potters, often children, learn the main principles of pottery making related to handmade techniques by making smaller pots. This practice creates a learning environment with less risk attached, both in terms of potential for wasted material and the failure to meet social expectations. So reducing wasted material was especially important as the process of gathering clay and returning to a village was time consuming and needed to be worked into task scheduling and the selection of clays was further connected to decision making related to social, economic and symbolic sphere in the community. So as potters learn the craft, they familiarize themselves with the materials, the hand gestures, the rhythms, which allow them to successfully increase the size of their creations and create well-made pots according to social expectations 
established by potting communities. So according to Jim Skibo, large pods require significantly more skill and embody knowledge related to all aspects of production. So as a result, fundamental knowledge bases need to be first developed. So starting small and gradually improving one's ability is connected to scaffold and learning, a learning environment in which there is an ideal balance of practice and assistance from skilled craftspeople to gain knowledge acquired to successfully complete particular production tasks. And this type of learning is often used in, in um, contemporary modern pedagogy uh, in university settings. In this paper, I apply an investigation of this learning practice to shed light on the connection of the various production sequences. As one learns to make a container, the, there's a learning about the methods of maintaining consistent wall thickness, handling potential tools during use, executing design structures, successfully firing and reducing breakage, connecting practice to traditional teachings and ceremonies, and so forth. So even in stricter learning regimes associated with pottery making, which you, you can, uh, there are case studies in East Africa and in um, the American Southwest, various skills are being practiced simultaneously. So although particular stages of production may be taught more sequentially. So to highlight an example of this technological entanglement that's at play, uh, Greg, Bond's, Greg Braun's petrographic study suggests potters considered color as an important variable of pace that was attached to ceremonial significance. So in this case, understanding the selection and preparation of materials and firing practices is connected to cultural knowledge related to teachings and oral traditions, rather than isolating uh, production stages. The focus relationship helps to create an understanding of the entanglement of the various knowledge forms. And with scaling, sometimes you have uh, adult skilled crafts people who rely on uh, scaled down versions of uh, tools to successfully achieve their goals. And here's a great example. I was at a friend's place, uh, college for the weekend a couple of years ago, and I went fishing. They didn't have a, a, a full size fishing kit, but I used this tiny little one, but I caught a fish and it was a perch and it was delicious. So it was a success. It's kind of a side note. That's just a little break until we get into the materials and methods. So ceramic samples for this study were taken from late woodland villages in Southern Ontario and New York. So for the Southern Ontario samples, I focused on data collected during my doctoral thesis, as well as the ceramic collection, a ceramic collections housed at the University of Toronto Mississauga campus. So for this study, samples required a substantial number of ceramic artifacts varying from very small to large pots. So for the upstate New York samples, I focused on data collected at the New York State Museum in Albany during my doctoral thesis that focused on 15th century collections that had a substantial number of learner vessels. So uh, just to kind of correct a little bit of what Chris said, this is linked to my thesis, but this is stuff that I took out of my thesis because I wanted to get the thesis done. So I removed that and focus on some key elements. So logistical reasons related to time and resources resulted in the selection of two Middle Ontario Iroquois villages dating to late 13th to 14th century and five late Ontario Iroquois villages dating to mid 15th to 16th century. Uh, some, the dates might be slightly adjusted depending on uh, if you follow the recent work done by Jen Birch, uh, who is uh, redating of, of Keffer and Draper, uh, push it forward. And there's a new paper out by John Hart that I, that I think changes the date of Garoga as well. So just a little bit of context of the pottery production in this area. Uh, this is a seasonal household activity. Historical accounts indicate that they were practiced mainly by women and young girls. Although there was no reason at young ages that little boys could have been doing this as well. Gender was fluid. Gender division really developed later on. It didn't develop right away. Um, late woodland potters practiced paddle and anvil techniques to make glo globular pots uh, with pinching techniques often being used to make smaller versions. A variety of drying techniques and impression techniques were practiced, either in the form of linear stamping or punct punctating uh, to create banded linear geometric designs on the rim, neck, or shoulder section of a pot. So here are the sites here. So to investigate decoration and its relation to scaling, motif and decorative element variables were evaluated. 
So first I performed a distribution analysis of rim motifs using uh, the motif category that I developed in, or formed in my, uh, in my thesis. So the first three motifs are considered simple motifs in the sense that only one type of decorative element is used to make a decorative band, uh, where the remainders are considered complex in the sense that they combine multiple simple motifs. So in this study, motif refers to full decorative band, which in this case is located on the upper portion of the neck section and the collar. So according to David Smith, this method of evaluation allows for an assessment of the stylistic relations of variables and complex multilinear stylistic developments and does not isolate or overemphasize specific decorative traits. Uh, second, I employed a micro stylistic analysis to evaluate decorative actions and learning. This approach aligns with Holly Martel's work on craft production in the contact period at the ball site and John Kreese's experimental study on learning environments and its impact on individual variation. So for this study, I measured the decorative element width shown in this uh, figure, a variable caused by a tool breaking the clay surface. The variable evaluates tool thickness, impression force, depth of pressure applied, and the relative dryness of clay when decorated. To maintain consistency, the middle of the decorative element was measured. So element widths of five decorative elements were measured with a digital hand caliper. Um, and I demonstrated that in another paper elsewhere that five values on a full vessel um, is statistically representative of the values of the, of the vessel. So rim shirts were categorized into size groups to evaluate motif distribution element widths in relation to their pod size. So the neck diameter to wall thickness was measured to evaluate size following my doctoral thesis, as well as uh, work done by Hart and Brumbach who used these ratios to study technological change in the late woodland in the Finger Lakes region of central uh, North New York. So traditionally rim diameters have been used for size analyses. And in some cases with more near complete vessels, volume can, can be calculated um, and be measured. However, evaluating a ratio of wall thickness and diameter recognizes the size and proportion are traits potters learn to master related to transport, transportability, fireability, friability, and heat conservation. So by taking the thickness and the size, you're creating a proportion and you're, you're creating more of a visualization of a 3D kind of um, value of, of the vessel. So in addition, ratio accounts for rim shirts with small diameters that have consistent thinness and indicate a potting proficiency. So those are those small skilled, skillfully made pots or pots that are abnormally thick relative to diameter size, which may not necessarily indicate um, low skilled and it could also be a lack of skill, you know, related to another community of practice, maybe practicing a technique that they are not fully familiar with. And so there's a slight variation there. Uh, to calculate ratio, I measured the neck diameter rather than the rim diameter. So Braun notes that the presence of castellations on the rim of uh, Northern Iroquois ceramics and the fragmentation make it often difficult to accurately measure rim diameter in comparison to neck diameter. And this is something that I've I identified too when I was doing my thesis, especially when you're dealing with those castellations where you really have those protruding castellations. So by doing the neck, it's going to be more in some cases a little more ovular, but it's going to be more representative than uh, the castellation that isn't necessarily circular. Um, so following these guidelines, so then what I did is I used, they had to have 25% of the neck circumference to measure the neck. And this is based on, on guidelines by the ceramic, some ceramic board of something. Um, following these guidelines, I looked at all the available ceramics for each of the collections, which in some cases, because of these uh, conditions, resulted in a small sample size for some size categories listed above. Uh, for some samples, there are a limited number of larger vessels, as my focus for the paper is learning fundamental skills developed with making of smaller vessels. Um, and also, again, logistical. It, the thing is, is you measure the vessel and then you get the value. So it's, it's hard to kind of predict what a larger vessel's ratio might be. So when you're getting up into the medium and large, 
you're just kind of measuring randomly and hoping that you can get enough to fit within each of the size categories. To calculate thickness, I calculated the mean thickness of measurements from the rim, neck, and shoulder section when available. So four diameter thickness ratio size classes were used in this study. So very small, small, medium, and large. Pot sizes that exceeded this value. So very small, zero to 10, small 10 to 20, medium 20 to 30, and large 30 to 40. So anything exceeding 40 was not measured due to insufficient sample sizes. A side note, what's interesting is when I was doing the, the measurements, the vessels at Keffer exceeded into the 40 and 50, but the vessels at Garoga did not exceed 40. They were normally around 30 and 40. So that was interesting in itself. So uh, then to evaluate the element width and size, a series of statistical analyses were conducted. So first the element width and size were plotted to identify potential positive or negative trends. Then to evaluate differences between element widths for each size class when compared across samples, I conducted a series of ANOVA tests with uh, 0 0.05 level significance. When only two samples were available, I looked at a student T statistics. Uh, all you need to know is I use statistical programs and I follow the assumptions and the, and the values are correct. So we'll just leave it at that. Okay. So, uh, when I first submitted this, I broke it down into all of the motifs that I show in this table, but the reviewers for a broader audience felt that it'd be better to break it down into three main kind of groups of uh, plain, simple, and complex, and then with an other. And so that's what I've done. And so just to some of the patterns here, what you see is on the very small vessels, uh, if you see on the on the tables here, I've highlighted the kind of the total means for uh, for the various relative frequencies of the sites. And for the very small vessels, you have a high level of plane, which is not surprising. That's that's what uh, Patricia Smith saw. You have a high level of simple. You have a, a decent amount of complex, and then you have some other. So what it shows is in, in a lot of cases here, the complex are uh, usually going to be number seven. So that the, the horizontals um, over obliques or obliques over horizontals. But what it shows is that smaller vessels don't only have simple decoration. There are attempts at more complex decoration. Now, in my other analysis that I did, even though they're attempting these decorations, they're doing it poorly. So they don't understand the design sequence. It's often imbalanced. It might be shifted downwards. It, the uh, spacing is off. Uh, the design grammar is off. Um, elements, the, the, the consistency, the, uh, the, the aesthetic of it is off. There's all these different elements that you can look at. Now, if we look at small vessels, we see that there's a decrease in plane vessels, um, a significant decrease, but we still find some plane vessels. Uh, we see a similarity in simple. So we're seeing a continuity so far of pretty much the simple motif is mainly oblique, mainly either oblique, oblique slash vertical. Um, and then again, you see some increase in complex numbers and then uh, there's a, a couple, a couple other vessels that kind of fit within within some other um, categories. Now, if you move up to the medium and larger vessels, you see absolutely zero plane uh, vessels. Uh, you see a similar number of of simple decoration. You see a similar level across the board of again of the obliques much higher at Keffer. So you can see at Keffer, almost 70% of the, of the vessels of this size um, were, were primarily uh, obliques with some being horizontal. And that's actually significantly higher than both Draper and Garoga. Uh, so Clock is high, or Wellington is higher, uh, but you can see the sample size is smaller. And, and that's one element of, of, of some of these samples. The smaller samples, you have to be a little bit more careful about. Now, you, moving to the largest vessels, you can see that again, zero plane vessels, 
continuity in simple. So in, in a lot uh, more of the, um, of, of the obliques, we see a decrease in complex, and then we see an increase in, well, so here it, 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 it shows, uh, yeah, okay, these, uh, these, the percentages are off for the large uh, means here because they're being thrown off by um, the zeros, but you can see there's significantly more complex motifs at Garoga, uh, which is a con a, an ongoing theme compared to Keffer, where you're seeing a lot more of these uh, simple motifs, um, but you still do get some elements of these different variations. But the, the theme that I'm trying to show in this table is that even though the vessels are getting larger, there are some commonalities in decorative traditions and there are some differences, but it's not a straight, you know, positive, smaller vessels have low, no decoration and, and barely any simple decoration. And then as they get larger, they gradually learn. So it's kind of showing that flexible learning that I talked about earlier, where uh, learner potters are trying to develop complex motifs and or have the ability to do so and they have the ability to do so and make these pots to get fired, which I think is the most important element there. Okay, so now moving to uh, the, the element widths. So what I'm showing here, this is just the mean values of the element widths in each size group uh, for the four size groups. So you can see almost in all of them, as you're moving up to, for larger vessels, uh, the size of the um, the size of the element gradually increases, which is not really surprising, especially when you look at uh, we, if you look at the aesthetics of northern Iroquoian pottery, the larger vessels. It's almost like there's a proportional element there of the size of the decorative elements are linked to the size of the vessels. You don't often see really, really thin, thin decorative elements on much larger vessels compared to uh, on, again, on the smaller vessels. In most cases, they're very thin. Um, and sometimes made with punctates, they could be thicker. Okay, so just to show here, what, what is shown in this table is exactly that, that relationship is as you're moving between the vessels, or the size groups, you can see at the bottom here, the, there's a gradual increase. So here, this is the mean, this is the mean, this is the standard deviation. And you can see in each of the size categories, there's an increase um, for the decorative elements. Okay. Now, the results of the, of the ANOVA indicate that, okay, so in this case, uh, if the p-value is below 0.05, that would indicate that there is a difference between the samples. If the value is above, it indicates that there may not be a difference. So for each of the size classes in the middle Ontario Iroquoian sample, so that would be Antrax and Wellington, uh, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. So the p-value is above 0.05. So when all size classes from each side are combined, the results remain the same for the middle Ontario Iroquois period. For late Ontario Iroquois samples, there are some similarities and distinct differences. So the results for very small pots indicate difference between group means is not statistically significant. For the remaining classes, small, medium, there are statistical differences between each group means, which is not the case for larger vessels or large values. So the results of the middle Ontario Iroquois and late Ontario Iroquois samples when combined indicate there are statistically significant differences related to size class with the exception of larger pots. So overall, the results of middle Ontario Iroquois samples indicate the element width means are statistically equal while only the very small and large classes have statistically equal means for late Ontario Iroquoian samples. Um, and I think I forgot to include the tables, but again, uh, the, 
the publication will come out next year and you can see all the statistical data. So I'll leave that for, for, for seeing that later. But the, the point that I was highlighting is the very small, the middle Ontario Iroquoian, you, you, uh, there's a lot of similarity. And with the late Ontario Iroquoian, similarity with the smaller vessels and the larger vessels, not so much. But then what's interesting is the large vessels on, uh, on the late Iroquoian vessels have similarity. So it almost seems that they, they max out at the thickness of the, of the tool element, which is an interesting point in itself. So in the following section, the results are discussed in more detail to shed light on scaling practices and potting communities. So I then provide an interpretation of social learning practices and propose very small and small pots were made by learners. So to begin, the results of the motif distribution indicate that Middle Ontario Iroquoian potters made very small and small pots that were decorated with complex motifs. Beginning in the late Ontario Iroquoian period, the relative frequencies of decorative motifs indicate potters who made very small pots often left them undecorated, either as a conscious act or as a result of not engaging with decorative practices. As the pot size increases, undecorated decreases significantly. On most occasions, medium and large pots are decorated with the exception of the Garoga sample, but site reports for each site indicate a small percentage of undecorated pots. So we can just go back to uh, go back here. Although there's a high relative frequency of undecorated pots, the results indicate potters decorated pots of all size, but some trends still emerge. So for middle Ontario Iroquois and late Ontario Iroquois samples, very small and small pots would be to be more associated with simple decoration in comparison to most medium and large pots. So medium and large pots for both periods appear to have been decorated with either simple or complex motifs. And this trend is also evident on a small number of very small and small pots. It's important to note that the more complex motifs found on larger pots rely on motifs commonly found on smaller pots. So overall, there are some clear differences related to motifs for larger and smaller pots, but there also remain some aspects of decorative continuity in terms of the use of simple and complex motifs, although to a lesser extent with smaller pots. Beginning in the middle Ontario Iroquoian data, the results of the element width analysis indicate minimal variation relating to element width for Antrax and Wellington. So the results for late Ontario Iroquoian data differ. Data from the very small and large size classes suggest continuity while data from small and medium sized classes do not. A lack of continuity is not surprising given the distinct local variations related to ancestral Wendat and Mohawk communities in Ontario and New York respectively, as well as the array of techniques and tools available to potters. So for example, each of the Mohawk assemblages are dominated by pots with a drawn decoration, which contrasts with the linear stamp techniques most commonly practiced at Keffer and Draper. Uh, and even when I was looking at the vessels, like some of it, you, you can actually tell very clearly that the uh, larger uh, uh, Garoga vessels were, had a, were much thinner and had a different look and a different aesthetic than what we were seeing at the uh, Keffer and Draper site. So even with similar techniques, potters in the late Ontario Iroquois period experienced the social impact of coalescence and other village social interactions, resulting in exposure to new stylistic varieties. So data for the large class do not align with this narrative and may have been influenced by a regional trend related to maintaining particular artistic aesthetics related to the scaling of decorative elements to pot size or potters being limited by the impression surface of a tool. So with that being said, the sample size of large pots are significantly reduced for Draper and Smith Padgery. So sampling bias may have been impacting the results and larger sample sizes would help clarify that, um, those, that interpretation. So in contrast to other size classes, the results of the very small class suggest a level of continuity in practice, both in technique tool and decorative motifs. And so this is the one we see continuity in the middle Ontario and the late Ontario and combined across, uh, across that time period. And this is further uh, strengthened Oh, sorry. I suggest learners who were inexperienced and lacked skill were the primary makers of the pots that fall into the very small, and you could argue as well, the small size classes. By learning the craft through a focus on making smaller pots, learners developed fundamentals that allowed for proficiency in forming and decorative techniques. 
Making a small pot allows for more control when decorating the rim and visualizing the finished decorative band, which I think is a really important thing when, when you're trying to teach somebody something, if you teach them all these small elements, but you don't teach them what the main goal is, they may have difficulty grasping what the purpose of their actions are. Um, so making a, uh, oh, sorry, forming pots allow a potter to learn basics related to consistency and proportions that are instrumental to making larger pots and reducing failure during firing. So although learner manufacture most likely involves smaller pots, it's important to note that they may have had opportunity to work with skilled potters as previously highlighted by uh, Crown uh, in, in her argument that in some cases you have very skilled potters working with children who are decorating a small section of a nearly complete vessel, both in form and decoration. So there are three points to consider that support learners as the potters of the very small and, and, and small pots. So first, pots on both sizes are mainly undecorated or decorated using simple motifs. So we have, if, if we look at the one decoration, uh, the most common decoration motif is undecorated. Uh, and then if you, when you combine all the simple, when you combine horizontal, oblique, and punctate, it becomes uh, um, more common. But the point is, is you still have 30 to 40% of plain vessels on these smaller vessels. Uh, this trend coincides with a high frequency of undecorated learner pods elsewhere on the neck and the rim section. And we talk more about this in a paper that myself and Daniel Ionico just uh, recently published in uh, Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory. Um, cool paper on child groups, so check that out. Uh, an unskilled potter would have less understanding about the scheduling related to achieving the ideal leather dry state required to properly decorate a pot, which may have resulted in missed opportunities or loss of interest in completing the full process. Uh, further, inexperience will result in a lack of knowledge required to execute proficiently complex decorative motifs present on larger pots. And just as a side, in, in experiments I've done working with children, I've often found that the decorating element children were not really enthusiastic about. They really liked making the pot, but when it came to decoration, I, I, in one case I lost out to SpongeBob SquarePants. And SpongeBob SquarePants was more exciting than my teaching them how to make pots. But it could have been maybe the teacher was just not a good teacher. Okay, so uh, the, it's important to note that skilled potters were not limited to complex motifs. They had a level of proficiency that allowed them to execute a wider variety of motifs. Second, the result, uh, sorry, the results of the smallest pots are related to the narrowest element widths and there's less variation for element widths. So if we consider Martel's description for element width variables discussed in the beginning of the paper, a narrow element width is linked to the impression force being applied and pottery decoration pot when the clay was beyond leather dry state. So furthermore, although not formally measured, when I was looking at these vessels, they were often not as deeply incised as the, um, in proportion to the more skilled vessels. Uh, and this could suggest that a lack of knowledge related to proper technical gestures and lack of recognition of the timing related to dryness and degree of plasticity. So they don't have an understanding of how the material is gonna interact and how it changes through time. And so that results in a particular material trace. Uh, lastly, the similarity in element width indicates potters used a limited number of techniques when decorating. So we know in larger vessels, there's a lot of variation, different kinds of techniques, different motifs. Uh, that is not a surprise whatsoever. But with the smaller vessels, they're very limited. So there's a very uh, limited number of either the techniques or the motifs, which would seem to indicate a commonality across these, these uh, learner potters. And this aligns with previous ceramic analysis that recorded high frequency of drawing techniques in, in particular with pots uh, believed to be made by learners in comparison to other techniques for Northern Iroquois assemblages. And this work has been done in Southern Ontario and in Quebec. So by Bernier, um, work by ASI, Dorland and uh, Robert Pierce. So just to show some examples here, here 
th this was really interesting because th this is three pots from Kefir. And just to kind of what looks like is taking place here is a similar motif is being practiced. Uh, and the pots are slightly varied in size. And so you start to think like, okay, well, maybe if these are, you know, two to three generations, either the same person could be doing this or the same group of people could be doing this. I'm just going to leave that, you know, leave that up to you because I, that's where you, it's a little harder to kind of create individual learners and tracing individual variation through time when you don't have complete assemblages. But you can identify these scaling where they, they're not, it, when we look at learner vessels, small vessels and large vessels, they're not a dichotomy. They have a lot in common. You see elements, you see collars on them, you see motifs that you see on, on larger scale vessels. The, you see the same shape, you see elements that they're putting the notches on, on, the, on the collar. And then here's another example where the, the, the shape of, of the vessel is being practiced, even though it's much smaller. And then you can see that there are some differences and similarities on the larger vessels are smoothed down. The surface has been smooth. On the smaller pot on the left, you can almost see finger impressions. It's it, it hard to measure the fingerprints, but you can definitely see the formation of where fingers are. And you could even see, for example, you know, this right here. It's really interesting working with these small pots because as you're interacting with them, you could almost feel and see how the potter would have engaged with these particular materials. So before concluding, I wanna briefly evaluate what the results can suggest regarding tool use of learner potters. So potters who made the smallest pots were limited in their abilities to decorate using varying techniques and are limited in the type or tools of implements. So in addition to lacking impression force, a narrow element width is also in indicative of the use of the tool with a narrower surface. So the broad scale pattern of lack of variation in width appears to indicate that learners did not use certain tools or did not understand how to complete certain techniques. So tool use for decorating is not discussed in great, great detail in ethnographic case studies, but Conkey has studied domestic tools were often viewed with a certain level of personal attachment created through their experiences. And talking to Richard Zane Smith, the Wendat Potter, um, who we have a paper that we're working on, the personal connection to these tools, uh, he also recognizes that they're not just these utilitarian tools, but they represent a lot more than that. And even when he's working with the pots, he sees the pots as ancestors and the tools themselves have ancestral links. Um, so as a result, if tools were not passed down, learners would have had to learn how to make their own tools and would have developed their own spiritual and social connection. So it's not only just learning how to make the tool, manufacture the tool and use the tool, but it's understanding the meaning uh, behind these tools and how they're being used. So while learning tool making, they were also experimenting and gaining knowledge related to scaling practices and learning how to make larger pots with appropriate proportions, establishing decorative traditions. So keeping that point in mind, element width increased early on as demonstrated by the small data, which leads me to, su to suggest that learners early on in the process had access to tools and practice techniques associated with skilled potters. So one could interpret results as representing skilled potters who prefer to use less force or who use narrower tools when decorating de smaller pots to create a unique aesthetic. This interpretation would be plausible if they were thin decorative elements and all the remainder of the variables indicated a high level of skill, such as high motor skill, proper understanding design grammar, and understanding of trades as pot proportion. However, that's not the case. Often they're decorated in a way that indicates they don't have a strong practice working with motifs of this particular um, tradition. And so it's, if they were very lightly using them, then we would still see the ingrained embodied knowledge and enskillment of the potters as they're making pots. Just think about if you, play an instrument, or if you are an artist in any way, it's very hard to unlearn what you've ingrained into your body over years and years of practice. It's really hard. They've even done some like how to unlearn how to ride a bike. And it's, it's a pretty funny video, but it just shows once it's ingrained in your muscle memory and in your cognitive memory, it's very difficult to undo that even after many, many years. Just think about like after having gone on a bike for 20 years, you jump back on,
you know, it takes a little bit of time and then, then you're, you're good to go. Um, okay, so, so then with that, it's highly unlikely that skilled potters purposely decorated vessels in a way to have an aesthetic that made them look badly decorated. And so we see a lack of consistent spacing and we see they're going against these established traditions. So it's, it's very unusual. It could be plausible, could be possible, but it's just very unusual and all these other uh, forms of evidence don't really support that. So furthermore, the results of a, a, an experimental study that I did, oh, here's one more of the scaling practices. I just forgot about this one. This is another cool one. This is ladder hatched, another uh, from Garoga. And you can see that they're, they're trying to get the full design. They're trying to put in the ladders. Uh, they're trying to put the, the motifs, but you can clearly tell that they're missing things. Now, what's really interesting, if you look closely, and I, I'm trying to explore this more with, um, uh, I, I talked to Suzanne about this and talking to Christiane Gates St. Pierre, is you can see elements of this pottery seem to indicate some kind of implant of a skeletal element. Sometimes it's, you can kind of link it, others is really difficult. Uh, there are some that we think could be done by uh, in, uh, molars, uh, deer molars. Now, where evidence for this is a colleague of mine's arm and a tooth that we impressed in the arm and compared it to the pot. So not really systematic, but for now, it, it, it start, you know, that could be a link to link. We never really think of tools of pottery in Ontario and the Great Lakes. We always focus on the decoration or the production, the technology but the decorative technique is often not really um, looked at too much. Now to go back to where I was, so the results of the experimental study I'd done looking at fingernail impressions found that on learner pots, uh, the shirts, and these are from Kefrasite, are statistically significant. The dimensions of the fingernail impressions on these Kefir pots are statistically significant to children ages three to six and seven to 11. I had a bunch of children adolescents, adults make pottery and I decorated their, and I measured the, the, the length and uh, the, the, the length and the, the, the thickness of each of the fingernail impressions. And the Kefir samples match statistically the, the children and the juveniles and have no connection whatsoever to adults. Now you could argue that potentially, uh, the potters in the past had significantly smaller hands, uh, but there's been uh, studies done looking at the uh, skeletal remains in Ontario that indicate that there wasn't a significant level of uh, nutritional develop nutritional deficiency that would significantly decrease overall uh, physiological size. And looking at average statures and stuff like that, it's not that far off from what we see um, in today's society. So considering the time required to learn uh, the teaching fundamentals, the knowledge pertaining to symbolic representation, ceremony and teaching, it's highly unlikely that potters entering adolescence would have experienced significant practice to become proficient potters. So the whole element of learning the practice has to take place. If you are 20 years old, 500 years ago, you're trying to raise your family at that point. You don't have time to learn the craft that you're supposed to be help, you know, passing on to younger generations. Okay, so when evaluating element width, variation may have been caused by change in technique. As stated above, linear stamping is rarely present on learner pots. So if punctates are found, they're usually inconsistent, vary in shape. Um, and when compared to the common presence of linear stamp decoration in larger pots, the lack of availability or inability to require, um, to make the required tools help explain the absence. So other than clear diagnostic impressions, which I talked about, there's not a whole lot of work done looking at tools. Uh, so that's a really interesting area we have to get into. So in this paper, and to, conclu to conclude, I propose an avenue to approach social learning and scaling practices of potting communities by evaluating the relationships between decorative data and vessel dimensions. So through an evaluation of social learning that is based on measuring material traces related to potters, tools, and potting materials, one is able to develop an effective methodology that is widely applicable across potting communities of practice 
from varying spatiotemporal contexts. So in this paper, I propose a method of evaluating a particular aspect of social learning centered on scaling practices. And uh, in reading Catherine Camp's work, the Sinagua child potters, it appears that they don't use scaling. They learn all these skills early on and they're making larger sized vessels at a very young age. So we have to be very careful not to apply a universal model of learning or learning experiences. Um, and so as highlighted by Lancey, understanding the nuances of learning uh, and the different learning experiences that individuals uh, engage with throughout their upbringing um, are going to take place in various forms. So we have to be very careful not to essentialize here. And then one avenue here that I'm hinting at, but I'm not fully suggesting in this paper because I'm gonna suggest that in my doctoral thesis paper and I've suggested it elsewhere and I wanted to kind of get away from it a bit was, who are these learners? Well, I think the learners are children, but I don't say that in this paper. I, I'm, I'm insinuating it and you can look at the evidence, but what I'm getting at is this is a methodology where we can look at skill and then we can go from there and we could get to questions of childhood. And children and identifying children seems to be a very difficult task for indiv individuals to recognize. They recognize children were in the past, but they have difficulty, a difficulty recognizing evidence to support that. And through the, all these different methodologies, we're developing ways to rethink about social learning and to bring in all levels of skill when we're looking at social practices. When we're looking at potting communities, we can't ignore elements that don't fall into standardized typologies or particular motif, you know, stylistic analyses. We have to consider the broader community practice. And that is it. So I'd like to uh, first again acknowledge the Indigenous Nations uh, that the research and the materials that I worked with. I'd like to acknowledge University of Toronto and uh, Archaeological Services Incorporated uh, for helping with uh, provide site reports, the New York State Museum, the Canadian History Museum. Uh, when I went there, especially uh, uh, Ralph Latal, who is a big help uh, technician there and, and Stacey Gerling Christie. Um, I'd like to thank Christine St. Pierre uh, and Susan, uh, Suzanne for her, the comments on the paper. They told me to stay away from linking it more to skeletal and focus on the decor. And I think that's a good idea. I think it's better. I think there's two, I think, you, I think that's a whole other element there. Um, I'd like to thank my fiance uh, for providing love and support. Um, and yeah, thank you all for listening to this talk and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>